Okay, everybody, welcome back to our Food Dialogues. Missouri, because we've had these around the, uh, around the nation in a couple of different cities, and now we are in Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri. I'm Tom Bradley. I host a morning wake-up show in Columbia on uh, The Eagle, 93.9 FM. Excited to be streaming live from Reynolds Journalism Institute here on the uh, campus of the University of Missouri in Columbia. Thank you to everyone who's joining us live here in, uh, in our room and also online. We've had great questions so far, both in person and some that were sent in by Twitter or, or sent in uh, via email. Uh, you can continue submitting those if you are viewing online, on Twitter, to at USFRA and at Mo Farmers Care, uh, and also using hashtag FoodD. You can also submit questions on Facebook at facebook.com slash Mo Farmers Care. Guests in our live audience, also you'll be invited to join up as you did last segment and grab one of the microphones to my left or right. Just push that uh, little button until it turns on red and you'll be ready to ask a question. I'd like to introduce our panelists for this second segment and it's just can't we all get along. Speaking of that, we'll start from my left to my right. Dan Shaw, State Director of the Missouri Grocers Association. Dr. Fonson Kidwaro, Department Chair of Agriculture at the University of Central Missouri. Jim Thomas, vegetable farmer and chairman of, and past president of the Missouri Organic Association. Dr. Kevin Wells, assistant professor of genetics, University of Missouri. Jennifer Polniak, clinical dietitian and diabetes educator at Boone Hospital Center. And Blake Hurst, Northwest Missouri farmer and president of the Missouri Farm Bureau. Welcome to our panel and let's just get underway. And you guys likewise push that red button on your microphone when it's, when it's time to talk. Let's start off asking a question, maybe to Dr. Kudwaro or Dr. Wells, genetically modified organism. The heck is that? Dr. Wells? <clears throat> so typically we use the word GMO to refer to, to uh, organisms that have a gene that has been moved uh, from one organism to another. But in this country, um, FDA considers all of the cultivated species as genetically modified. We've been selecting for changes in allele frequency, a uh, variety of mutants since domestication. So all of our food is genetically modified as compared to wild type. So typically you'll hear me use the word genetically engineered to differentiate the two. Um, does that help? Well, it helps a little bit, but it, it probably sends me down a road of confusion at the same time. So ge genetically engineered, All right, so meaning what some people are referring to as GMO? Yeah, I, when the average person talks about GMO, they're talking about genetically engineered. A, a great example to sort of put this in perspective is um, I would challenge anyone to find wild type broccoli, wild type cauliflower, wild type cabbage, wild type Brussels sprouts. Go look through the woods anywhere on the planet. You will not find them. They are not there. They are a product of cultivation and selection. And in fact, they're the same species. Those are all genetically modified. We've been doing that to every species that we cultivate since domestication. When you say d domestication, how long are we talking about? 2,000, well, 5,000 years? How long have we been cultivating and modifying broccoli? Um, broccoli's sort of Asian in origin, and I don't have the answer for you for broccoli. Um, but the first domesticated species were um, likely to be on the animal side, uh, dogs and some of the livestock. On the crop side, it was grains, clearly. And uh, we carried those from place to place and, and kept choosing the ones that we liked as the parents for the next generation. And over the years, we decided to have animals that were less docile. Uh, we really don't like getting bitten and kicked. And uh, we began to select for crops that had characteristics that we like. For example, uh, corn refused to, refuses to spread its own seed. What sort of plant is going to survive in nature that won't spread its own seed? But we kind of like that. That makes it easier to harvest. And so we began to isolate um, uh, different combinations of genes that provides characteristics that were useful to us. So again, they're pretty much all genetically modified. The exceptions would be some of the berries, uh, some of the, uh, the nuts, tree nuts, they're not that far from wild type. We haven't been doing a lot of selection there. So we've been doing that genetic modification 
for hundreds if not thousands of years. Well, sure. Nobody was talking about it and saying this was a bad thing. How long have we been doing the genetic engineering? <clears throat> well, it's going to depend on the species that you're talking about. Uh, the original genetic engineering was all done in bacteria. Um, most of that began in, in the early to mid-70s. And uh, as years have passed, we've learned new techniques to um, apply those same technologies to more and more species. Dr. Kidwaro, would you add anything to my question of what exactly is a genetically modified organism? Uh, he's spoken like a geneticist, and I agree with what he's talking about. Uh, I want to talk, uh, when I talk to my students about genetically modified organisms, uh, America's number one when it comes to agriculture for two reasons, abundant natural resources and technology. One of those technologies is uh, genetic uh, GMO, genetically modified organisms. What has happened over the years, the technology that was developed by the Norman, Norman Bolog that actually powered the Green Revolution, in terms of uh, increasing yields, we have reached genetic potential of many crops. We cannot put any more ears on corn. We cannot put any more pods on a soybean. So what's happening now, in order to increase yields, we have to look somewhere else. And to look somewhere else, we have to look at things that limit yields. And those things that limit yields are pests, and uh, pests such as weeds and insects. So what's happening in science is to actually genetically engineer a plant so a plant can protect itself from those pestilence. By doing so, we are able to increase yields. Like Monsanto has come up with the earworm resistant, and they're proje projecting increasing yields tenfold in order to feed the increasing uh, population. So our challenge is how do we feed the increasing population? If we're going to be 9 billion people by the year 2050, we have to find ways because we can't put any more ears on corn. We can't put any more pods on a soybean. We have to look somewhere else. And we have to engineer those crops so they can protect themselves. What he's saying is correct, because we have selected over the years, we have engineered genetically, but we're looking at the way you and I understand is to allow that particular plant to protect itself. And that's how you come up with the Roundup Ready soybean, Roundup Ready corn. You spray Roundup, you kill everything else except the corn. Uh, it helps. We're going to continue down this path, but I think we should never lose focus of the end consumer. So I turn over here to Dan Shaw with the grocers here in the state of Missouri. How important is what they're talking about right now to y'all? I think it's very important. Uh, the consumer has learned a great deal through their uh, research on the internet, whether it be true research or true facts on the internet. And uh, we continue to get conversations with our consumers on is it GMO, is it good for us, is it bad for us, is organic good, is it bad, what's the best thing I can get, why does this cost this? So I think these conversations are very beneficial to us so we can educate our consumers when they come in and ask questions. Our goal is to sell the safest, uh, best quality product at the most reasonable cost to the consumer. And that's really what we're there for. What the consumer wants. Exactly. You mentioned organic, so it's been brought up. So while we're establishing some definitions, at least among this panel, I turn then to Jim Thomas, who is a vegetable farmer, chairman, past president also of the Missouri Organic Association. What is organic? All right, uh, and I'll talk in terms of certified organic. Uh, um, several years ago, we came up with a program called the NOP, the National Organic Program. Uh, this was a, a program uh, trying to um, uh, give commonality to the term organic because a lot of folks were claiming organic so what is organic and so they come up with a program uh, <clears throat> to be organic um, part of that is that you have to have uh, your soil uh, free of all uh, commercial herbicides pesticides uh, commercial fertilizers for a period of three years um, and then you have to go through a <clears throat> excuse me an inspection program uh, where you have a third party inspector uh, that comes, uh, you have a strict record keeping program uh, where you uh, uh, record what you apply to the soil, uh, what products are used, and those products can only be those that are approved uh, by the National Organic Program or the uh, actually approved by the inspector that you're working under. Um, the inspectors are, uh, they are um, uh, uh, approved by the National Organic Program, and you have different inspectors all over the country. Um, that are licensed to inspect organic farms. Uh, and so uh, then you, you follow the uh, guidelines set out in the National Organic Program, uh, then you are inspected and every year you go through a, um, 
a reinspection process where uh, you have an inspector come and verify uh, what the, pro the uh, programs that you're doing on your farm. Organic producers, are they concerned about genetically modified or genetically engineered organisms? Yes, very much so. Then if I turn back to Dr. Wells, wouldn't I ask you and say, didn't you say before that pretty much everything out there has been, to some extent, genetically modified? Yeah, but, but I, I'm, just uh, I'm sorry, push the, push the button. Sorry. Thank you. I, I think it's important to clarify the words. Mm -hmm. And I think for the general public, those are used interchangeably. And they're really only referring to genetically engineered, the average person. OK. Right? But, but these words do have definitions, and, and they do have meanings. And we have been modifying the genetics of our cultivated species since we began. It's only recently that we've been able to take genes from an unrelated species, a non-natural breeding partner, and move it into another species. And so, Jim, these organic producers are trying to make sure that they're not using any of these that are now being genetically engineered, the GMOs. They're trying to stay away from those. Yes, and, and we differentiate, at least myself, and, um, we differentiate the difference between what he said in the fact that, yes, when, and we call it uh, 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 plant breeding, where you selected a, a uh, um, something in the plant that was inherent in that plant, a characteristic that you saw in that plant that you liked, and you tried to isolate that and reproduce it uh, in a parent plant. My, my father worked with uh, decalp seed corn for several years, and they grew seed corn, and, and so they had two parent uh, seeds that they would try to uh, breed to produce a higher quality hybrid seed. And that's what we've done for generations, like he said. We've come up with all these plants that, because we, we studied the plant, we saw characteristics that we liked, that we wanted to improve upon, and then we chose those plants and tried to replicate that. What they've done with the genetic engineering is now they're capable of taking uh, a gene that is not inherent to that plant and forcing that plant to accept it and, and uh, making something uh, totally different. And so uh, our question is we don't know uh, and they don't know what the replication of that are. And, and we come with more questions than we do answers on some of this because uh, we tend to question, you know, how, how safe is this? Uh, some of the things you read is some of the things they're even find out since they've started doing this. Is some, of, some of these things are not stable once they put them in there. And, and uh, so it's, I don't even think the scientific community uh, knows totally uh, the long-term ramifications of what some of this uh, is doing. And then some of the things that they're able to do, uh, you know, concerns us as far as, like he said, the part of, like, of some of the things they're doing with the GMOs is that they are uh, able to, uh, excuse me, genetically modify that plant or engineer that plant so it produces its own insecticide. Now, they use an insecticide that, uh, in the case of like BT corn, they use an, uh, a product that, that has also been approved organically, but ours is topically applied, the sun breaks it down, it's washed off. Theirs is bred into the plant so that you are consuming that uh, as part of the plant now, when you consume that product. Obviously uh, a concern for organic producers like yourself, but what about the common farmer across the state of Missouri? Blake Hurst, Northwest Missouri farmer and president of the Missouri Farm Bureau. You farmers like this GMO action? You don't like it? Where do you, how do you feel about that? Well, sure, it's been a great uh, advantage to uh, conventional farmers all across the state. It gives us a lot of, uh, uh, saves a lot of pesticides, uh, allows us to no-till farm, which means we don't have as much erosion. Uh, so it's a benefit of the environment, and it's a benefit of our, uh, our cost structure. Uh, when we use genetically modified seed, we save money. And that eventually gets to Dan Charles' customers. Uh, so so we, uh, we think it's been a great boon to agriculture. You understand, though, and you, you hear the response from some portion of the consumer community out there about GMOs, not understanding it, being worried about it, wanting organic. Well, I, I'd make two points. Um, Mr. Thomas talks about... Uh, putting uh, genes into crops from different crops, uh, several, including, I guess, the leading example would be wheat, several of the crops that uh, we're very familiar with were uh, first originated as wide crosses between two different kinds of, uh, different kinds of plants. Uh, a lot of the seed we use is actually, uh, a lot of the breeding has been done by exposing the seed to, uh, to radiation 
uh, planning what results and see if there's a beneficial mutation. Um, we've been doing breeding and improving plants and animals for about 10,000 years. Uh, this is another step on that road. But as it turns out, it's much more precise because instead of crossing two plants with uh, mutated genes, because that's how you improve plants is with mutations, uh, instead of crossing two organisms with mutations we don't understand, we're placing a single gene uh, into a plant so that we have a pretty good idea what the result is going to be. Um, to argue that we don't know the result so we ought not to do it is to argue against all progress. Uh, we'd still be living in caves if we said, well, we ought not use that technology because we can't imagine everything that will result from it. Uh, the same could, could be said of the internal combustion engine of electricity, uh, modern medicine of any advancement we've made. We never know for sure everything that's going to happen. Uh, we do our best, uh, best investigation. Uh, we learn as much as we can, then we move forward. GMOs, gen genetically engineered seeds, have been approved by the World Health Organization, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the British Royal Society, and the American Medical Association, the U.S. National Academy of Science, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the UN, the British Medical Association. In fact, every well-recognized medical or nutritional society that has looked at this technology has found it not materially different than uh, traditional breeding methods. Blake, first, I, I mean this with the utmost respect, uh, and this is not toward you, but I think there are people that hear what you're saying, and when you got to those different bodies with their approvals, what they heard was blah, 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 blah. They're not believing it to begin with, I think, from my point of view. And so I think, there, I think that's one of the reasons for the food dialogues is to bring this together. And, and what you said is important. I'm just putting myself in their shoes and imagining what they're thinking. You were going to mention something, Dr. Yeah, Wells? I, I was, because I, I think there's a, a clarification that needs to be made that's useful for the discussion. As, um, as Mr. Thomas mentioned, um, sometimes the transgenes aren't stable. Well, guess what? None of the genome is stable. That's why selection works. That is not unique to adding a transgene. That is true of every gene setting in the genome. Um, he couched it in terms of we force a plant to accept the transgene. The, the, the plant is not being asked a question here. It's sort of like saying when we cross two plants, we force them to accept genes from one another. It, they're, they're loaded terms. And so it becomes very, very difficult to have any sort of rational conversation. We're left with fears of the unknown and passions. And it would be nice to have the conversations without those sorts of terms. Although, obviously, there are going to be some pieces of them that can come up. And I want to call on Jennifer Polniak now. You're a dietitian. Uh, how much of this is, is important to you? Are, are you just dealing with the fears and mis misconceptions and perceptions by the public? Or it, are there some, some real factors involved here when it comes to you and health? Well, to be honest, the, the patients that I see this is probably pretty low on the totem pole for their importance um, because I'm usually working with people with a chronic disease. Um, there are a select few that this is a pretty important, you know, piece of information for them to have and they want to know and they um, are more, probably more concerned with where their food is coming from and I do believe that a lot of, a lot of terms are thrown around that are not well explained to them, and you know, when they, when they come across these terms, they have nothing but fear because they don't know what to do with them. And, and in, you know, in the last um, panel, there was a lot of talk about you know, education and getting the, you know, these words out in the public so people understand what they really mean. Um, I think that that is, is definitely a very important um, piece of information that needs to be shared. I think that the population that um, cares about this, like I said, as far as my patients are concerned, they, they want to be healthy. And um, they come to see me because they want, want what particular illness taken care of. There are others who come to see me because they do have particular concerns, and this does come up. Nutritionally, for the patients that I'm dealing with, there is not a huge difference between the organic the non-organic, and as far as you know, for the, for our concerns, our purposes, 
there is not a huge nutritional difference between the genetic engineered and the not genetic engineered. You speak from a professional perspective and about your patients. What about your friends that are Friday evening and you're sitting around having a glass of organic wine <laughs> or non-organic beer, whatever it is. After we have a few, it doesn't matter anymore. It, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Walked right into that, didn't he? We, uh, we have a local winery, Les Bourgeois. They're bringing some in here in about 45 minutes. Um, when, you're, when you're around with friends or when you meet someone and they find out you're a dietitian, do they say, hey, I got to ask you a question? And do they bring up this subject matter? Does that happen? And what do you say to them? Usually when the question is, um, is presented, it's not so much presented, but um, the emotion is what I get first. You know, this is how I feel about this. How do you feel about this? Mm -hmm. And so not necessarily a question, but more of a statement, what do you think? And so no one's really asking me necessarily for information. They pretty much want me to, want to tell me what they think. Well, we're talking about emotions and, and the average person, whether it's a Friday night after wine or wherever it is. Uh, Dan Shaw, is there a lot of emotion delivered in how you package and, and promote and offer products at the grocer's level? Is there emotion involved with that? And when it comes to things like organic or non-organic? I think uh, most certainly there's emotions whenever you purchase something. And we try to set up in our stores a, an emotion of, of not a euphoria, but a happy emotion that you're able to go in and pick and choose what you want. There's certainly uh, uh, some of the labels by the different manufacturers and vendors will, will make statements. And, and some of those will, will be made to raise their level of their product, but also some of them it sometimes will add question to whether everybody else's product is the same. And I think we're very careful about that, and we want to always try to encourage the manufacturers to label things that bring up their benefits instead of putting down something. And you have to be very careful when you label something as, um, as simple as ground beef, 85% fat-free. Well, if nothing else is labeled, is it 100% fat? Or is it, you know, so you got to be careful what the label's saying about the other products as well. So we're very aware of that. Does emotion? Absolutely. Uh, uh, th that's why we give the cookie to the kid while they're in the bakery. That's why we give them a sticker on the way out the door to keep the kid happy and keep their emotions <laughs> and everything in check. Jim Thomas, <clears throat> emotions? Emotions? Uh, as far as as far as you think they act on emotions, uh, and I'm sorry, Jim. My question is: <laughs> Are you driven by what you do with a lot of emotion? I'm driven with a lot of passion. Uh, I don't know as you'd call it emotion, uh, uh, because uh, I actually uh, come to where I am today by just asking questions, and I don't have all the answers. I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't know all the geneticists. I know when I first heard the GMOs, I questioned, um, you know, what's, what's the deal on them? Um, then I read an article about how they were made, and, and maybe it was factual, maybe it wasn't, but they looked like you bombarded the gene with a bacteria or a virus to get it to accept this new gene. And I thought, boy, you know, I just don't know about that. Uh, that raised questions in my mind. And I know when I first, and I grew up a row crop farmer, uh, I can remember just a couple of instances where my background is. Uh, you know, uh, we used to talk about, you know, these warning labels that they put on uh, all the, the uh, insecticide we're using, and this was back in the early 70s, you know, or, or late 60s, you know. Oh, that's just something the government made us do. You know, they're not that dangerous. And then one day my boss sent me to uh, destroy some insecticide sacks uh, and burn them, which probably was not a good idea back then, but that's what they done. But he did warn me, stay out of the smoke, because he had heard of someone that did the same thing and, and had a, uh, a hog go through the smoke and died. And so, uh, you know, he, he warned me to stay away from the smoke, that it might be very dangerous. Uh, and so uh, some of these things are. But then, uh, you know, uh, uh, I went to a meeting about a man that talked about health uh, and, and how you know, all, all life directly or indirectly comes from the soil. And how if you have a healthy soil, you have healthy plants and healthy animals and you have healthy people. And if you have a sick soil, you have sick 
plants and sick animals and sick people. And how, uh, you know, in this lady in the healthcare industry, uh, we're just going through a big healthcare change because of the healthcare that's rampant because we have a lot of sick people. Uh, and and uh, so uh, obviously, you know, there's something uh, wrong. And so, yeah, there's, uh, uh, you know, we have, uh, I have passion for it because I believe in it. And partly because in my own instance, I, uh, I've i cared for a family member who, whose immune system was destroyed, uh, mainly by an overexposure to farm chemicals. Uh, and uh, we've dealt with that for uh, some 30 years. And so I know the damage that it does to a certain percent of our society. And once again, back to these questions. I question, you know, it took about three generations for this to come up because we didn't have any chemicals before about World War II. You know, and we saw this after World War II. And so uh, we've seen, and, and you see an increasing number of people who have uh, autoimmune uh, problems. And so uh, these questions come up to me, and, and when I had a family member and I saw what it done, you know, then some of these same questions are in these genetically engineered products. And, and I think, well, you know, what about, uh, uh, maybe not so much me, but what about my children? What about my grandchildren? What's going to do with them? And, and the seventh generation has a quote from an Iroquois confederacy uh, on there. That's the name of they got their product. And it says, in every, in every deliberation, we must consider the effect of our actions on the next seven generations. And our question is, you know, we're not sure. You know, I don't, if my neighbors want to use this stuff, fine. My problem is, you know, can they keep it off of me? You know, as part of being certified organic, one of the things we have to do if we have conventional farmers around us is we have to maintain a buffer strip to keep their products off of us. And some of the question, why should we have to do that? We're not the ones putting the products on. Why shouldn't they have to maintain a buffer strip to keep it off of us? Mm -hmm. And so some of these things, you know, that, that make us to do it. And, and another thing is that, you know, uh, especially some of this geo, GMO drift that we're seeing, you know, because if we have plants that test GMO, I know uh, Safeco had to uh, dump their seed corn one year because it tested GMO positive. That's not allowed organics. They couldn't sell it organically. For, huge, for the people that don't, for the people who've never heard of this before, can you explain what GMO drift is? Well, take C and seed corn is the main one because uh, seed corn pollinates. If you see a, a stalk of seed corn, what we call on the top is a tassel. Uh, that's what produces the pollen. That releases and spreads over the field, uh, pollinating the silk that come out of the year. And, and that's how you get the kernels of corn. Uh, but this travels. Uh, it travels throughout the field. Unfortunately, it can also travel across the field and across the road. And so you're seeing some of this, especially in the corn, because the pollen does travel so easily. And so if that happens, if my product is uh, contaminated with, with and shows up GMO positive, then I cannot certify organic. So it has the potential of, of ruining my livelihood at least for three years because I would probably have to be out of certification for three years uh, if that happened. And then now they're coming up and I know there's a lot of concern about uh, them allowing a genetically engineered crops to handle 2,4-D. Now, I grew up in the 2,4-D era. You used to use a lot of 2,4-D. Uh, they had two forms, butyl ester and amine. Uh, I think it was the butyl ester you had to be very careful with because you could spray it one day if the humidity conditions and right and the temperature is right, it would get up and move and it, it has damaged soybeans at that time, it would damage soybeans a quarter mile away. Now, one of the jokes that we had back then is, you know, if you want to kill a tomato plant, uh, all you have to do is walk by it with a jug of 2,4-D. Now, they, can, they may be able to genetically modify a corn plant or a soybean plant to handle 2,4-D, but my tomato plant's not going to be modified. Understood. If that thing drifts, Jim, we need to move around a little bit. That's Sorry. all right. Um, I, I want to ask a question on, on this organic versus the GMOs, and, and maybe on a personal level. Dr. Wells, when you go to the grocery store, do you buy organic food? Um, okay. uh, mic microphone. Um, uh, occasionally I will. Uh, I tend to avoid the fruits. Um, because, as a general rule, I'd rather eat the fungicides on the fruit than the fungus growing on the fruit. Um, <laughs> but that, I'm, I'm being serious. I mean, that, that is the case. 
Um, I'm much less concerned about things like dried beans, et cetera. They store really well. Um, I'm, I'm a home gardener. I, I have family varieties of beans we've been keeping for lots of years. Um, it, it, I don't have the opportunity to, um, to make most of those decisions one way or another. Um, I tend to avoid organic when I can. You do? I do. Blake Hurst. Uh, I, I, I'd like to respond to a couple of things. Um, one of the things that Dan uh, said earlier was when he labels things, how important it is that the label that one supplier gives you not reflect poorly on a competing supplier's um, product. And that's one of the things that troubles I think we have in agriculture. You know, uh, one of the great advantages to living in a country as well off as the United States is that people have choices when they go to the store. And if they choose to choose to buy Mr. Thomas's organic products, uh, that's that's great. I mean, that's that's uh, that's important. That 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 makes them more wealthy in a very real sense. But when agriculture do ourselves no good at all, um, you'll never see uh, Chevrolet run an advertisement that says if you drive a Ford, you'll be dead before you get to the end of the driveway. They'll say, drive a Chevy because you'll get the best looking girls or, <laughs> or the best job. Uh, my product will make you feel better, feel younger, uh, be more successful. And that's a very, you know, that's a very traditional form of agriculture, of, of advertising. But they'll never say, don't buy a Ford because you're going to die. And I think we in agriculture could learn from that, from that example. Uh, we need all kinds of agriculture. We need all kinds of agriculture producers. Uh, we all benefit from that, but we need to be very careful about how we talk about the rest of agriculture. Having said all that, I feel like it's important to point out, because it's organic does not mean that it has not been treated with a pesticide. It means it's been treated with a pesticide that's allowed for organic production. When you buy that fruit and it's organic, it's been treated probably with copper sulfate, because that's the only thing that'll kill a fungus. That's a heavy metal. You put on pounds per acre. It's toxic to the person applying it, just like the synthetic chemicals that I use in my farm. Pesticides are effective because they're toxic to the intended victim, and some, or, you know, victim meaning intended pest. That's how they work. So we all have to be careful with them. But no matter what the means of production, we face pests. We have to deal with them the best we can. And sometimes the things we use to deal with them, whether we're organic or conventional, can be harmful if they're not used correctly. So, so, so that's life. That's the root. That's the game we're in. Um, we we we're, we're faced with uh, challenges in order to produce uh, crops, and we do the best we can. So again, I think agriculture needs to be very, very, very careful how we talk about other parts of agriculture because we're all important. Continuing with my question, Jennifer, do you buy organic? Sometimes. Um, it really depends on price which, um, you know, makes a huge difference. Um, you know, um, I will also look at the product and if it looks good. Um, I don't base it on nutritional value. Um, I know there are lists that talk about which, which um, foods that you buy hold more pesticides versus less pesticides, and um, sometimes I'll take that into consideration. Um, more than likely, when I'm looking at organic, I'm also looking at the bigger picture. I'm looking at, you know, hopefully to get something relatively local. Um, you know, if I'm going to go to the farmer's market. Now, you know, recently I've been told that not everything at the farmer's market, you know, I was always under the impression you go to the farmer's market, it's all the same kind of organic, um, locally grown. But it's, that's, that's, again, that in itself is somewhat of a myth. But I do buy organic sometimes. Um, I tell my patients, if it's your choice, if you want to buy organic, great. If you know, some there's kind of a feeling of good. You feel like you've done something a little bit better. But again, you know, I I, I go back and forth. I'll I'll buy what's what's a good looking product at a good price. We're welcome to questions here uh, locally as well as those who are uh, watching online uh, streaming. Can and I'll go to one of our questions that we have from. Drew, before I do, I'll just say something myself. If you, if you want to address this, fine. I don't think tomatoes in the store, no slam against you and your guys there, Dan. I don't think tomatoes taste as good as they did 15 and 20 years ago. 
That's me. I've mentioned it to a couple of people, they've said the same thing. Uh, when I eat homegrown tomatoes, and it's not mine because I'm not very good with a garden, when someone else gives me some, they taste fantastic. Along those lines, do you think the nutritional value and or taste of the crops, the livestock have gone down in recent years? This is a question from Drew out of Kansas City. And we'll start with our dietitian, Jennifer. Well, the nutritional value of food actually changes, you know, um, within, depending on how ripe it is. Um, not in any real significant way, but for example, you know, how much carbohydrate versus how much uh, protein and fat and can change, especially the carbohydrate. So, you know, for example, if you eat a, um, a not very ripe banana, you know, it's less sweet, um, there's less glucose available, so it's, it's not going to maybe affect the blood sugar as much as if it's a very ripe banana. And part of that just has to do with, you know, the, how long that, how, how fast it takes for that particular amount of glucose to break down. And so, you know, that can change. And so if you, you know, if you eat a tomato that's, you know, like a store-bought tomato that's not very ripe versus a much riper tomato, you're probably going to get a little bit of a higher carbohydrate content. Is that a good thing or not a good thing? It depends on you. I mean, it may give you a little bit more energy, but if you have diabetes, it may affect your blood sugar a little bit differently. So, you know, it's, there's a lot to think about there. Blake, has our nutritional value gone down in some of our foods over the last decade? I don't think we've seen much change. I, I find it, I, I mean, I think it's interesting uh, that you don't think tomatoes taste as well. Uh, there's no doubt that the tomatoes we get that have been shipped from a long ways away don't taste as good. They're picked before they're ripe in order to be handled. They're, 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 the varieties are chosen uh, for ease of handling over taste. Uh, but the local ones still taste pretty good. You have a, do you have a greenhouse? Yes, we do. What do you, what do you grow in your greenhouse? Uh, flowers, uh, bedding plants, and a lot of tomato starts. So in other words, when you when you want to put your so garden, so I have to start I have to garden. You're going to give uh, me yeah yeah garden. that's what I, I would say, and we'll sell you some tomatoes. <laughs> I've we'll actually make, make you a deal, yeah. Or find a neighbor with a good garden. Yeah, yeah that's what I need. Uh, Dr. Wells, have what have we seen in the last ten years? Have we seen any change in our nutritional value in our crops? I would say what we've really seen is um, the effect of consumers making choices, and consumers want pretty food, not food that tastes good. I disagree with you. They make their buying decisions on colors and shapes and firmness. And then they get home and they're disappointed about the flavor. You know, when I was a kid, we used to be able to get these ugly looking tomatoes that had big wrinkles in them and one side would bend up around and they were wonderful. Right? But you couldn't buy those in the grocery store because they're ugly. It's just the way it goes. I mean, we essentially consumers want a tomato that you can stick in a box put it on a truck, haul it all the way across the nation, including potholes and train tracks, and get it out and it not be bruised. Because it's got to be pretty. You're right, right? that's what I want. Right? It's what I want, Jim. Yeah, and probably, maybe the only time him and I are going to agree today. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, uh, he's right. Uh, we have, we have uh, um, our fact that in, in America we can buy most any kind of food we want any time of the year uh, has ruined people because they don't know about seasonality. And uh, uh, just a, an instance, a, a story I'll tell you, we was in uh, a restaurant, I won't name the restaurant uh, <clears throat> for them, but they were actually quartering tomatoes. Uh, and they were using a thing, I, we, or have one we used to just slice potatoes with. Uh, they would run through a wire thing and it would automatically quarter these tomatoes and I saw this lady doing it sometimes she would push and she would have to hit it again to get the tomato through now I had a load of tomatoes or I had some tomatoes on my truck from market that day uh, I said I've got to see this I gotta see what them tomatoes look like I mean they come out they were still perfectly shaped I told you if she'd have taken one of my tomatoes and done that she'd have had tomato juice all over the restaurant because it was soft. I had a lady uh, come to my stand one day and pick up a tomato and she said, ooh, this is soft, it's no good. Her husband was behind her, he said, that's the one you want. That's the good one. He said, I was in produce 20 years, that's the one. But we have trained the American people that a tomato should be rock hard because the grocers want something that they can buy and, and, and like you said, stay in good condition because people don't realize how much waste there is. They're continually going through food and sorting it 
and they want something that keeps because that helps their profit. And so the tomatoes have been bred for shelf life, not for flavor. And he's talking about these old wrinkly ones, heirloom tomatoes. And some people say, yeah, they're better. But um, um, I don't know, I had one one time. I didn't think it was any good, better than my organic one. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a matter of taste. But, uh, yeah, th they don't. And, and the thing is, like they said, they ship it from a long distance. They used to. I uh, heard they put ethylene gas in them. Uh, they'd pick them totally green, and they would turn them red, come to market. And I tell people, you're buying a red, green tomato. I can take you out to my vines and pick a green tomato and slice it, and it will have the same texture and the same flavor as one that you buy in the grocery store that was picked totally green and ripened artificially. Now, before because we move past that, did you just proliferate a fallacy? Is, is, is it true that they're doing that? Yes, uh, they, they ripen them. and, and they're switching from that because the consumer got tired of it. Uh, they, were, they were ripened. He can maybe tell you more than I can as far as how they used to be ripened. Uh, but yeah, they, you know, they ripened them because they just turned red. And, and, uh, and then two, you can pick green tomatoes off the vine, they will eventually turn red. But they're never going to have the flavor uh, of one that's sun ripened. Uh, that's ripened in the in prime conditions. I feel like so. Dan, you're going to take the brunt of this thing, even though you haven't grown one tomato. But I'm get, <laughs> I'm getting my tomatoes from from you. W what is going on with the grocers? And you have said your job is to deliver what the consumers want. Are you bringing the consumers what they want? And you can use tomatoes as an example or anything else. I think so. Uh, you know, to to use ways that we the consumer wants a tomato on New Year's Day. You come to me and you want a tomato. I'm gonna to do what I can to get you the freshest, best tomato you can. I may have to source it from somewhere across the world, and I'm gonna to try to get you the best product I can. I'm gonna do that with every product, whether it's beef, whether it's pork, chicken, whatever. I'm gonna get you the best product that you want. If you don't want it, if I don't sell it, I smell it. And that's not good. I'll, I'll do everything I can before I throw it away, even if that means donating it to food banks and everything else. But we're, we as, as the grocery industry, we're in there to serve the consumer. To, um, so I think really time has become the thing that's changed flavor for you is that you're wanting that tomato in January when traditionally, I don't think in the backyard we can get a tomato out of our garden. Yes, there's hot houses and greenhouses, but it's just not the same. And nothing is better than being able to take something that you've created yourself in your garden and slice it up. And because not only are you tasting the tomato, but you're tasting the, the sweat of your labor. So is, is there a good chance too that I'm tasting tomatoes now throughout the year? Because obviously when they're grown locally, so when they're from Missouri and it's tomato ripening season and they're at my local grocer, those are the best ones I'm having all year. Is it that I'm taking in the whole year and in January I'm having some tomatoes that just can't be anywhere near as well, good? I, I think I think that could possibly be true as well. And you'll see most of our retailers are buying, bringing in local product, har local harvest things. Just like what the farmer's markets are doing, we're trying to put it in a convenient spot so when you're doing your rest of your grocery shopping, you can also have some of the fruits of, of the local land. Let's take a question from our local audience, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Chapel. I'm from Truman State University. And for the past couple of months, I've been working with the GEM program, the germplasm improvement of maize. And um, from my, my research and the work that we've been doing, I've noticed a lot of people are kind of going towards GMOs and we're forgetting about um, local cultivars and seed saving and seed banks. And um, from what I've read, a lot of seed banks around the world are in disrepair and they're just seed dying in storage. What do you think, what do you feel, do you feel that the public needs to know about these seed banks, that more money needs to be dedicated to them in order to maybe down the line find a gene that we need that isn't necessarily GMO? Why don't we look to Dr. Kidwaro or Dr. Wells? Well, uh, CIMIT is one of the centers that deals with genetic research, and they have a lot of uh, uh, stock germplasm that's kept to keep those original varieties intact. And also, uh, Monsanto has one of those original uh, corn varieties that are available. I think in Europe, they've built underground, where they've kept uh, seed from many varieties in case we have a disaster. 
heaven forbid, that we'll still have some of these germplasm that we can actually plant. Maybe he can add to that. Uh, it, it, I agree with everything that he said. There are places where, the, where many varieties are being preserved. There's also lots of local groups preserving things. Um, I actually buy a lot of heirloom varieties because I'm particular about flavors. Um, and so I, I like to grow things that I like to eat because I can't buy them because things are m marketed in mass. Uh, but at the end of the day, the varieties that are used are the varieties that people buy. And since the American consumer buys on price to a large degree, the seeds that the masses plant are the seeds that we're going to have. And that's just the way it is. I just wanted to add to the tomato a debate here. Maybe <laughs> someone else will dispute this. I think uh, there was, uh, uh, there was a, a need to develop a seedless tomato, and they succeeded. And then when they took a bite into it, somebody said, oops, we goofed, put the seeds back in. What's happening is, is that you have, maybe that's why it has changed, because they're making the, the seed thicker, so you can transport it. Maybe they have reduced the number of seeds inside. That's why the taste has changed. But I don't know that. That's for the geneticists and other people to answer. But the seed cavity has a great deal to do with the taste of the tomato. And, and so there is a chance it could have been genetically engineered and wound up with less flavor to me. I'm mad now about these probably GMOs. not. I'm upset. <laughs> but pr probably not for tomatoes. Um, one of the first to, uh, genetically engineered organisms that was going to come on the market was called the flavor saver tomato. And um, it turned out that they picked the wrong variety in the first place and it, they never really made it out of California as far as marketing is Because concerned. of flavor? Um, Mostly because of yield. If it's not profitable, it really doesn't matter how good it tastes. But, but one thing I do want to add, and this just gets to, to, to chemical terms, et cetera, um, is earlier it was mentioned that, that they add ethylene gas to tomatoes. Keep in mind, that is the hormone that the tomato makes to ripen itself. Oh. That's why I need and, scientists and, nearby. And, and, and if you want to have a really nice experiment you can do in your house, apples make a lot. Put an apple in with a tomato, it'll ripen faster. Put an apple in with a banana and it'll turn black. Because apples make a lot of this gas. So it's, these are, these are very natural things that's being added. It's I needed you as a science teacher when I was in yeah. school. We have another question. Oh, if you would push that button on the bottom, please. And thank you. I guess my question for the panel would be, we've been talking a lot about out of season food crops. And my question would be, is the public better or not better off than our ancestors were when they never had fresh fruit off season? Or are we better off buying stuff that's been shipped a long ways and having our bananas and apples and you know, pea pods and all kinds of other things that are extraordinarily perishable? Well, I think we'll start with the dietitian. I think that's a, I think it's a great question. Probably could be thrown in there, not only having a ship, but also possibly genetically modified so that it's able to grow earlier or later in our own growing seasons. So we'll start with Jennifer. Well, I think it's an interesting question um, because I think that in the past when these things were not available to us seasonally, we figured out how to get by. We knew how to freeze, can, um, and make these products available to ourselves. And now we don't need to do those things anymore, the freezing and the canning. Um, I don't really know if, if, if we're having any difference in our nutritional benefit, or if we're having any nutritional benefit or not, because we've just replaced one you know, way of eating the food with another. Because I think that we've, you know, as human beings, we've always figured out how to get these nutrients in one way or the other. Um, it's, it's a lot more fun to shop when you have all the pretty colors um, available and, and it's it it feels like you it, you know you're just you know living in luxury in a world of plenty having all these things available um, so I think that it's 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 a good question I don't know if I could answer that completely um, but you know I, th I think we we consider ourselves better off we'll put it that way uh, aside from the fresh if we can stay with you Jennifer aside from the fresh what about frozen? That was a huge change in America when we started freezing vegetables, right? As soon as we could pick them, we were freezing them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Mr. Birdseye or who did that. But uh, I think that replaced a lot of our jarring and canning. Yeah. Uh, it, what about the nutritional value when it's frozen and or canned? 
do we lose something there? I actually um, prefer frozen, and I, um, you know, tell my patients to go for the frozen versus the canned all the time. You know, for sodium. Also, um, now the the canning people would say that they've changed their methods, and so that their products still, you know, when you get something canned in the grocery store, that it does maintain nutritional value. But you know, in the past, you know, heating something to the degree where you need to can it, you definitely lose some nutritional value. But I usually do tell my patients to go for frozen if they, you know, need something. And honestly, it's more convenient for the patient. You just grab what you need, and you know, I'm not real excited about the steamable bag thing, but that's a whole other argument. So, we can get into it if you'd like. We have a question. If you push the button on the bottom, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nora Ferris, and I'm representing the Concordia FFA chapter. It's often said that. Farming looks mighty easy when you're a thousand miles from the cornfield and your plow is a pencil. My question is, how are legislators and regulators with their removal from production agriculture affecting this issue? Fantastic. Fantastic question, even better could, phrasing of the question. Could, could I take a shot at that? It's all you, bud. All right. Um, I think we're seeing uh, increased regulation, uh, both, uh, well, typically, mostly environmental regulations. Um, they come from uh, the EPA when they work with water, um, from, 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 from local, local regulatory agencies, again, working with water and soil erosion. So, so I think it has become more difficult to farm. I think it's important that uh, regulations are needed, obviously, uh, but it's important that they be based on sound science. Uh, that they're not, uh, they're not made, the regulations aren't written, until people uh, involved, people affected, have a chance to comment, uh, until science has a chance to, to examine the question uh, that's being posed by the regulations. Uh, we can overreact uh, and lose the ability to enjoy the bounty we have uh, if we're not very careful. So, so, so it is a danger, it is a concern. Anyone else? Yeah, Dan. I would agree with uh, everything Blake says. The, the, you know, the legislators passed the law that dictates the regulations, uh, but I think we need to make sure we also look at the regulations. The people who are writing the, the, the regulations sometimes are equally as distant from, from the plow as well. And the legislators a lot of times will go on the information that they're, that they're given and the intent of the law is changed drastically by the regulations that are actually support the law. And I think that's where we have a lot of a, um, a heartburn, so to speak, about some of the regulations. The law was absolutely great, but then when it comes down to actually writing the regulations, it has no, nothing to do with the purpose of what the law was passed for to begin with. So, but thank you all for coming today as well. Another question locally? Yeah. Sure, thank you. My name is Steve Viley from Jefferson City, and uh, talking about legislation, a lot of legislation is uh, passed in regard to food safety. And my question is about food safety. When you look at organic food versus food that is produced perhaps with uh, genetically engineered crops, what's the record been? Uh, and you know, you hear in the news from time to time, uh, lettuce was bad. There was a couple of years ago where I believe it was uh, sprouts uh, from Germany. I think they were organically grown. People died, um, so so people can get sick and die because of food safety issues. And, and what's the track record with genetically engineered food? Has anybody ever gotten sick? Has anybody ever died because of GE? Well, Jim, I see that you'd like to. Oh, like you, you're, you're, you're an organic producer. I cannot answer the GE uh, uh, question. But uh, the food safety thing, I think what happens in, I know several years ago, I think the start of all this new food safety regulation that's, that they're working on now was actually from a, a spinach outbreak they had uh, uh, several years ago where some people got sick, and I don't know whether anybody died or not, but uh, people got sick. And I think many times when something like that happens, um, there's a knee-jerk reaction. Well, we got to do something about it. Uh, we got to, and and of course, you know, uh, legislation is job security for a legislator. And so uh, we had some legislator. We need we need new regulations. No, we didn't need new regulations. We just need to take care of the problem. 
you know, and, and I think a lot of that is just a knee-jerk reaction sometimes. And, and we got to remember uh, when you're dealing with food, you're dealing with a perishable product. And, you know, to me, it seems like the American people have lost, we, we ought to just take one word out of the dictionary, and that's accident. You know, there's some things that's just going to happen. They're an accident, and you try to you try to fix the problem. Whether it's the the egg person now, if they knew about it, you know, then then there's laws concerning that. But too many times, I think we we want to create some new program that we need to protect everybody, and that's an impossibility. Uh, we need to be, we need to have the safest food we can, and there's not a one of us here that that on this panel that do not you know deal with food. We don't want to make anybody sick. For sure, you know we we want the safest food we can, and and we try to do that. But you get all these regulations, and pretty soon they make it impossible uh, to to even exist sometimes. And and like Blake said, uh, we're you know we're forcing ourselves, we're, we're cutting off the the supply that we've had sometimes if we're not careful. Well, you know, saying that we don't want to make anybody sick, I would imagine that is true with everyone on the panel, Blake. Yeah, I, I guess I'd make three points. The overall incidence of foodborne illness is going down, going down fairly rapidly. Both conventionally raised food and organic food have been responsible for foodborne illness outbreaks and I'm, in the past and no doubt will be in the future. There's no recorded instance of any damage to anyone consuming genetically modified food. And Dan? I, I think it was a very good question, but I think what you need to look at on the outbreaks, uh, talking about the, the spinach, the lettuce, the cantaloupes, a lot of those happened after production, somewhere in the food uh, cycle, somewhere between uh, the time it was planted. It wasn't, the seed itself wasn't a food safety violation, something happened to it to contaminate. And I, I think that that's very important to, to note that it's not organic versus GMO, that food safety is an issue. It's whether is it safe or not. I think the other thing we need to look at, we talk about regulations, and we are very effective with food safety regulations. Some of the things that just happened in recent years is that we get the recall notice. It's always good when we get the recall notice that we can pull the product from the shelf. And we took to Congress. I guess four years ago, one of the biggest issues is that the FDA and the USDA were releasing their food call notices to CNN first, and then we'd get them hours later. So what would happen, they would show up in the news in our stores and say, well, you still have this stuff on a shelf. Well, we haven't got the notice. Oh, wait a minute, it's coming across now. So the government has worked very well with us to make sure that we are able to get that product off. And we, our association, the wholesalers, it's a very safe system now. It's improved greatly over the last few years on how that is communicated, and it's uh, become very effective, and uh, we can pretty much pull a product on a moment's notice now. And we would pull it in air rather than leave it on the shelf and think, well, is it, is it not? So. Dan, was that a department policy change or legislation? Legislative change. Another question. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Fritchie. I'm a faculty member here at the University of Missouri. Uh, my area of expertise is nutrition, and I'd like to reinforce what I've heard, that, it, that the, the data, the evidence, uh, is very clear that there is no nutritional benefit of organic versus conventional for most food stuffs that have been tested. Uh, we don't know about everything. We haven't collected data on everything, but certainly the evidence that's in right now suggests that choosing organic over conventional nutrition really isn't a very useful uh, guide. Um, but my concern about the use of genetically engineered uh, crops has nothing to do with the nutritional aspects, but it has more to do with environmental and maybe uh, risk uh, aversion, and it has to do with the fact that Monsanto's uh, crops, uh, their Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, have penetrated the market across the world quite to a, a great extent. And if somewhere down the road something happens where those crops fail, then my concern is this idea of monoculture and, again, our reliance on a single organism that, for whatever reason, might fail. I mean, I think about the potato famine, and I think, OK, if we had a soybean or corn uh, failure where, again, it was something linked to the, the particular uh, species or the particular crop that was being used, it would just concern me. And I don't know if that's something that, that the uh, 
if Monsanto's got some backup plan uh, in the closet, or if if the agricultural industry is real is thinking about this at all, uh, because again, obviously, the Roundup Ready uh, agricultural products are very successful and very effective, but that very success could, in fact, leave us vulnerable. And I'm just wondering what the people who are who, who might be able to think about the future and whether or not that's a risk that we can. Uh, address. I think that's a great, a great question, an angle to, to, to come to almost a game theory to say, well, what could happen? Let's play this out down the line and see where that could lead. Blake? Okay, we're coming like several different things. The concern would be if we're, the Roundup Ready gene has been attached to all different kinds of, 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 of corn, of varieties, right? Yeah. So, so, so ask the question a little differently. Say, are we so concentrated in a certain kind of corn variety that might be vulnerable to some disease? Because the Roundup gene would not make any difference. This variety might be susceptible to some new blight. This variety might not be. Both of them could have the Roundup gene. That's number one. Number two, it almost did happen back in the 70s. We had a corn blight, what, a southern leaf blight, northern leaf blight, I don't remember. It was very scary. We had a big loss in crop yield. So it is a concern. We're aware of it, and steps have been taken to keep that variety out there to keep that variation in the uh, genotype of our corn so that we're not quite so vulnerable to that. One th and the third thing I would say is we often hear people concerned about monoculture and then they go on to say a corn soybean rotation is not really a rotation because it's too short, it's monoculture. We very rarely see Haiti or Ghana or a place where they use traditional agriculture, a place where they have a wide variety of crops, a place where they don't use GMOs, we very rarely see them organize food drives to come to Iowa. When we have famine in the world, it's solved by what those areas of the world that are criticized for being a monoculture. I mean, food goes from the Midwest to get Africa. Food goes from the Midwest to Haiti when there's, a, when there's an earthquake. We, we don't... I mean, we say, everybody says, we gotta have this, we gotta have this variety, we gotta have this uh, long rotations, we gotta have this diversity uh, because we're in such danger. But every time there's a famine, it's somewhere else. And the solution is in Iowa and Missouri. Its solution is in modern science-based agriculture. Dr. So Wolf? I, I do wanna make sure that, that it came across to clarify the, the very first thing you said. To the idea that Roundup Ready corn is everywhere presumes that it's monolithic. Roundup Ready corn describes many, many, many varieties. Right? No. I guess my point is, is that is it possible, conceivable, that a virus or a fungus or something might take advantage of some aspect of the Roundup Ready gene? I have no idea about the chemistry of what Roundup Ready is doing inside. I know that it manufactures a certain chemical pathway and that that is useful uh, from the agricultural perspective. But right now, we cannot conceive of a particular pathogen that might do that. So my question is, is not that... Not the variety, Not but the, the variety, gene. the fact so, that that particular gene is in a significant number of our cultured soybeans, corn, and many other crops as it continues to expand. So you're talking about uh, one of the 23,000 genes that are there. Yes. Right. So that would be true of the other 23,000 genes also. Yes. Um, and, and from Jurassic Park, you know, biology finds a way. There is n nothing that I can come up with that's impossible here. Um, but I would, I'll take the one in 23,000 risk since I'm stuck with the other 23,000 genes regardless. So there's no, in your opinion, there's no increased risk? It, not, that, not that I can recognize. Okay. It, it poses no unique risk over conventional varieties is probably the way to put it. Okay. So, so while there, there could be a possibility, Vegas wouldn't be betting on that. You're saying that the odds of anything I, happening. I, 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 I am saying that, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at the same time. So for example, it would be like if we could uh, engineer people, which I have no desire to do, but, but, but we But made, you've mentioned Jurassic Park we, and engineering people, we, I'm just. But, but we made a brand new hair color. 
And the question comes out, you know that hair color is getting popular. Is that going to make us susceptible to a new virus and drive us to extinction or have some, some horrible event? And I'm left with, I don't think so, but I know I can't exclude it. But it would be true of all the other hair colors too. So unless you're going to get rid of hair colors, it, it's the same risk. It poses no additional risks. Do you, before we go to our next question, uh, do, does that kind of lean into make sense with what some people are worried about with GMOs? That kind of a question right there. I think the only thing that people are worried about with GMOs is that it is new. It is unknown. And the unknown is scary. Isn't, isn't that right? okay? So, so for example, let's, let's just condense this down. If someone takes a single gene that they've studied for 15 to 20 years and they move it into a crop plant, a gene for which they know a lot about, somehow society has decided that poses a unique risk that requires heavy study. Now, if they were to, let's use a tomato as an example. If they were to find some wild type tomato on the side of the hill and cross it into their tomato line and they really liked it, they could run down to the farmer's market and sell it. What did they do? They just introduced 23,000 genes from a poisonous plant family, the nightshade family, right? Just threw them in there, rolled the dice and said, yay. Which one of those is actually risky? Which one of those should we fear? It seems to me random is much more risky than intentional. Along those lines, one of the questions we have submitted says, you know, what we have right now is, with GMOs is altering nature, which has been perfected over millions of years, and that it is the random that brings about what we truly need today to survive. And that question submitted by David of St. Louis. Blake? Uh, if he thinks nature's perfected, uh, he doesn't know a lot of the folks I do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would go back to the point that Dr. Wells made. We've been altering farming. That's what farming is. It's altering nature. It's altering nature to benefit humans. We've been doing it for 10,000 years. This is one further step in a process that's been going on as long as history has been recorded. 10,000 years we've been changing nature to benefit mankind. That's what we do. That's what we do. And we say we're a farmer. That's what we do every morning. We change nature. We make it less natural. We put order where there's chaos. That's how come all of us are, are healthy and well fed. We, I, I'm willing to have, I, I don't want to leave today without making one final, one, one point I think is really really, really has to be remembered. About somewhere between 100 and 250 million people in this world suffer from vitamin A deficiency. There is a genetically modified rice, golden rice, uh, that can replace that vitamin A in the diets of people who are affected by this. The, it reduces infant mortality from people that use it by 24 to 34 percent. In other words, to replace that vitamin A to, to, to fix that deficiency in the, in the diet of infants helps prevent blindness, but it reduces infant mortality by a third. Now, we're rich in the United States, and we can make whatever decision we want about organic production, whatever decision we want to make about the adoption of GMOs. Oh, uh, right now, we're having a big argument. The orange, orange industry is in tremendous number trouble, there's a virus that's just wiping out orange trees, they're spraying pesticides, the pesticides are rapidly losing, uh, are rapidly losing effectiveness, and they're working very hard to genetically modify oranges so we can have uh, resistance to this virus. Now we can decide we don't want oranges, we can decide we'd rather have GMO free than have oranges, and we're just not going to buy oranges or genetically modified, and, and, and we'll get vitamin C elsewhere. Um, but people are dying, and people are going blind, while the technology that's available has been available for 14 years to solve that problem. And I don't, I mean, we can have these conversations and we can not get very emotional and we can talk about science and we can talk about all these things. But this decision we've made as wor worldwide that we're not going to use this, we're not going to do research on this, we're not going to move forward on this for 14 long years is causing people to die. And anybody that has concern about GMO, anybody that's afraid of GMOs, anybody that opposes that GMOs has to deal with that, with that story, has to deal with that subject. And uh, so I get emotional about that. 
Uh, Y'all, I mean, consumers are going to decide how I farm on my farm, and someday I may have to change a lot of my methods. And, and, and I will do that because obviously the consumer is sovereign. I mean, they, they make the decision in the final analysis. But this thing is really serious, and we really need to think about it. Jim Thomas? Yes, uh, and, and in relation to that, um, uh, what, and like I said, I have questions, and this is a question I'm, I, I'm trying to get answered myself. Um, and I think something that that kind of centers in the organic movement. Um, while I was searching for uh, health for my family member, uh, uh, we went to a biochemist uh, several years ago. He told me as a biochemist, uh, he would say that uh, in the lab, there's absolutely no difference between natural vitamin C and ascorbic acid. But he said, you put a natural vitamin C in your body and you'll use it, and an unnatural one will go straight through. Now, I'm not a scientist, but that's what he told me. And my question is, we're altering these foods besides something besides natural selection. Uh, and I found with my uh, family member's health, it's amazing what our body does. Uh, she picks up on stuff that, that, you know, most people say, well, there's nothing there. Uh, most of us, our body just, all right, you know, here it is, it goes through it, it rationalizes it. With her, it affects her, uh, uh, nervous system it you know she she treats it as a foreign object uh my question is and i don't know the answer uh, uh and that's why you know my my thing like the grocery is to err on the side of caution is these genetically modified foods and blake talked about the the more vitamin a yes we can put it in the rice and i know joe salton mentioned uh to get what they would get from their normal diet if they use the normal diet properly they'd have to eat 18 pounds of rice a day uh but uh uh would that rice that vitamin A, is their body going to accept it or is it going to, or is it going to um, treat it as something foreign and send it through? I don't know the answer and that's, that's one of the questions I've got and that's one reason for those of us that still uh, don't want to uh, uh, be the test subjects, I guess, for uh, genetically engineered foods, that's why we think, you know, in the organic movement, uh, none of us, I don't think in the organic, like to fool with the regulations of NOP. But we do so so that the consumer can have confidence and they can make informed choices. And I think the same is true ought to be the GMOs. They ought to have that same transparency. Hey, just put it on the ingredients. They list all the ingredients anyway, put GMO corn in there. So people know that it's there and then let them make the choice. And once again, educated consumer, uh, when they get educated, if it's safe and they want it, they can buy it. Another question? If you put the, yeah, there you go. Uh, yes, as a consumer, I think it all boils down to trust. You know, do I trust the genes that are being insert, inserted into a genetically engineered crop more than I trust the, the benefits maybe of organic? And I wondered if you guys could speak to uh, what sort of oversight and, and regulatory permitting or anything that is involved when a new GE variety comes to the market. Uh, what sorts of oversight are there? You mentioned the National Organic Program which I understand is still kind of in its adolescence, you know, and it's more of an, an industry initiative rather than a, a government entity. And then I'd also throw it to Dan, too. We hear stories like uh, companies are promoting hormone-free chicken when there are no hormones that are allowed in chickens. So the skeptic in me asks then, uh, how do I know, how can I trust that, uh, that a claim on a package is going to be better for me and not just some sort of marketing ploy? I think that's a great question. And I think that goes back to uh, uh, the relationship that you have with the grocer or with, with the person you're purchasing the food from. You have to have that level of trust. As far as the, the no, no hormones in chicken, um, I believe that's probably a marketing ploy because we've heard in the earlier panel discussion it's impossible. And I think that's one thing that the Missouri Grocers is trying to do is educate the retailers, and we've worked with Missouri Farmers Care extensively over the last few years to make sure that the grocer understands what's happening on the farm so we can better answer your questions when you come into our stores so that we're not like, uh, well, I read it on the internet, because therefore it's gotta be true. So we're trying to find the facts so we can educate our employees so that they can be a source of knowledge and trust. And I think trust is very important. Um, you never, if we have items on a store shelf that aren't safe, 
we're pretty much out of business. So we have to make sure that we continue to provide a safe product. And when Jim mentioned err, that we err on the side of safety, I, I want to, or err on the side of caution, I want to make sure we, we don't make a real distinction on what we try to sell between organic and uh, non-organic or conventional. We are on the side of food safety, and if something is proven to us or told to us that it's unsafe, we'll pull it. But we won't pull it just because it has GMO, because uh, unless we're told that it, that specific product is unsafe. Did I answer your question sufficiently? And that, that's, exact, that's exactly what I meant. Okay. I, yeah, I wasn't talking the GMO organic. That's exactly what I meant. That, and that's the same way with us, because you know we have some questions about GMO. That's why we choose to stay organic. You know, until some of these questions are answered, and uh, uh, so uh, you know, and and uh, you know, to some, the, I know the the paper that sent out said, "Can we coexist?" You know, uh, to some it's coexistence, to some of us it's contamination. You know, and and because we don't we don't want it. You know, until we're sure. You know, um, and uh, uh, and Blake talked about it being around for 14 years, but to some of us that's you know. There's still a lot of questions out there unanswered for some of us that they want it, and so we just want the freedom to to be able to to control our environment. I, you know, my neighbors all around me uh, use things that that scare me to death. You know, but uh, uh, I, uh, you know, that's their prerogative. And and hey, we need that right. And I'm a, uh, uh, you know, I'm less government regulation. I don't think we need to regulate. Uh, uh, all these regulations, they just bundle up the things. Our forefathers thought we need a small government. They were right. Uh, and so we're not, uh, we're not trying to shut down the co conventional farmer. We're just saying, hey, make sure, you know, if, if you've got a mean dog and you know he's mean, it's your responsibility to keep him locked up. You know, uh, just make sure that you can control your products so that they don't contaminate us. And if you want to use them, and if then if you know they're safe, and when they're proven safe, then you know you can call us foolish. But uh, you know, um, that's like I said, that for us, that's still to be determined. I don't know if you got a plug in there. I think I heard something about organic government. I'm for that too, yeah. Doctor Kidwardo. I think we have to be careful in terms of when you say us and them, and also not to let our emotion. Uh, deter the argument. What's happening here, he's talked uh, quite a bit about what happened to a member of the family and that you bring emotion into it because I'm against GMO because what happened here and therefore all GMO is bad. All GMO is not bad because what we need to understand, what he's saying is it should not pollute my field. We need to be able to understand uh, and do research because when something goes wrong, there are scientists that will find out why it has gone wrong. 777, Boeing 777, when they had a fire in, the, in that particular plane, they took it back to the shop and they found out what was going on. People are now flying 777. What's going to happen is once information is there, once he understands that GMO is safe, I think most people are going to embrace it. GMO has never killed anybody. None of the research that I've read said someone has died. But from organic farming, I think uh, uh, it's the bacteria. Uh, e. coli has been very uh, fatal to some people in organic farming. Those emotions and the us versus them, no matter which side you're on, and leading up to, uh, to this week, I got my new Reader's Digest in the mail. And uh, I love Reader's Digest. The new Food Wars, Big Mac versus Big Organic. I, I don't think this was my own personal mailing. I think this is across the nation. Is this good or is it bad? Is this bad hype? Does it make... Does it make it's things American. tougher on all of us here? It's American. It's, it's, what, it's what we do. These are arguments of luxury. There is no example of any harm coming to anyone anywhere on the planet from genetically modified organisms. Zero. Right? There is nothing that I am aware of that would justify questioning the safety. Right? And that's important. We're asked to evaluate the safety. What are you afraid of? Right? One of the things a scientist needs is a hypothesis. If there's not a specific thing, if it's this nebulous, well, it's new and I don't know, and it might maybe be associated. What are you afraid of? I mean, I would love to know that. I will go do the experiments. I am not smart enough to identify anything of risk here. That's really important. And unlike organic, 
everything that so far that's come onto the market that's genetically engineered has gone through FDA. The gene itself and the gene product is evaluated for safety, and thus far all the plants, and that's all that's on the market, there are no genetically engineered animals on the market, have been evaluated for equivalence. Other varieties don't have to do that. I can go to the grocery store and see yellow carrots. They are never labeled nutritionally deficient low beta carotene carrots. That's why they're yellow, because they don't have the same nutrient content. They don't have to be labeled. So I, I think we just need to, to recognize the scientists would love to do some experiments associated with any specific thing that anyone fears. The analogy here is what if someone says, I don't really want that to come onto the market because I think it'll drive the moon out of orbit and it'll fall in Chicago. How do I do the experiment to evaluate that? <laughs> oh, what? Boy. Were you asking, was that rhetorical? <laughs> Blake. Read the headline again from the New York Reader's Digest. Uh, the New Food Wars, Big Mac versus Big Organic. Who will save America? Da -da -da. We, we really are having a discussion. I mean, we're having extended, I mean, it's, it's, it really is extraordinary uh, for those of us that have as much white on top as I do, how 20 years ago we didn't have these conversations. And, um, and I would be less than honest if I uh, said, I, I guess it never occurred to me as a farmer and, and someone that's active in farm organizations that this was how I was gonna spend uh, the latter part of my career involved in, in, in what's an extended war. I've, I, I, there's a great article by an author named Mary Ebersett, I'd highly recommend it to any, anyone, who says food is the new sex, uh, that we no longer uh, have all the values about sex that we used to, but we have lots of values about food that we didn't used to. And it's really quite an interesting argument. So we're in one, we're in a long discussion. Uh, and we in agriculture are, uh, are part of it, and uh, it's our job to be as transparent and visit with everybody as much as we can and, and do as good a job as we can of explaining why we do the things we do. And I guess it is easier to talk about hamburgers uh, in a panel like this than it would be sex, so that is one good thing. <laughs> <laughs> For all of our local audience, that discussion is tomorrow at 2 p.m. Um, I, I, you know, it would be great to wrap it up with that, Blake. It really brought a lot of stuff together, but I can't move on without answering some Twitter feeds that have come in. Ms. Polniak, Jennifer brought up steamable vegetable bags in the microwave or something, but don't even get me started about that, but we have three minutes. What, 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 is, the, what is it that... I guess it's just another fear of the unknown, honestly. Um, you, know, the, there, you know, in the past, we've the whole idea of... Um, cooking in plastic versus cooking in glass. Um, it's, fear, it's a fear of mine. All emotion, probably. I don't have a lot of science to back it up. I mean, I've read a few articles um, about, you know, different, you know, polyurethanes and, I, I, you know, and that kind of thing. But honestly, I will have to admit, it's a, a fear of the unknown, 100%. Okay, Jim? If I could, I'd like to clear up a couple of things said earlier. One was Jennifer's talking about she assumed when she went to a farmer's market that everything there was organic and locally grown. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, I'm a member of the Columbia Farmer's Market. I were there every week, and <clears throat> up until about three years ago, I was the only certified organic grower there out of 100 vendors. Now we've got about five, I think, four or five out of 100 vendors that are actually certified organic. Now there's some that are chemical pesticide free, they claim, but they, they're not certified. Uh, and also, uh, Columbia is a growers only market, meaning that everyone that's in that market has to grow and produce what they sell. Uh, you, and we have, there's a program, you see a lot of these signs, know your farmer, know your food. And that's important, you need to ask the farmer, you know, and, and get a feel for the farmer of, hey, <coughs> did you grow this, you know, and and what, you know, what products have you used so that you have the, the consumer has the uh, capability to make choices. Also the grocers, uh, you know, he kind of gave the indication that because it's organic, it's higher. Uh, folks come to my stand, a lot of times you can buy my stuff cheaper than you can at Walmart. Uh, it's not necessarily always higher. Uh, yeah, there's more work goes into it, but it's not necessarily always higher. Jim, I think we have time for one last question. Okay, thank you. Michael Seipel from Truman State. Um, thanks to the panelists. Mr. Hurst brought up the case of golden rice, and I think it's an instructive one that this is, is a crop with 
many potential health benefits, um, addressing nutritional deficiencies, and yet since 2000 it has been in development and yet to come to fruition. On the other hand, it took Roundup Ready crops only a few years to achieve more than 75% market penetration. To the scientists on the panel, do you have concerns that this research seems to be driven uh, primarily by private versus public funds? And to the farmer or farmers, um, do you think this is fueling consolidation in the seed industry, and is that a concern? Start with the scientists on public versus private funding. You, you know, most of the things that come to market come from private funding. It, it is the nature of what comes to market. A lot of the basic research was actually publicly funded. Um, USDA participated in developing many of the technologies associated with making uh, genetically engineered crops. Uh, the first genetically engineered livestock was also done at USDA. Um, so it's, it's not that there's no public input, uh, but at the end of the day, those people that can bring things to market are private entities, and they are generally not going to be interested in doing that if they can't own it and sell it. And so one of the ways to make a technology die really fast is dump it into the public domain. What company is going to invest in getting this through all the regulatory agencies that we have to jump through their hoops or we can't go to market? Who's going to pay for that if the moment that you get through the regulatory process, your neighbor can sell it because it's approved? Nobody's going to do it. Blake? Yes, it's always a concern we're not doing enough basic research. I would make the same distinction he does between uh, basic research and commercialized, you know, commercializing a product. Uh, and yes, we're always concerned about increased concentration in the industries that we buy from or in the industries we sell to. It is always a concern for agriculture. Okay, thank you. We'd like to thank U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance as well as Missouri Farmers Care and our panel, Dan Shaw, Dr. Cadwardo, Jim Thomas, Dr. Wells, Jennifer Polniak, and Blake Hurst. Give them a round of applause, please. And thank you to, uh, to all of you for being here, as well as those who've uh, been watching online as well for our food dialogues from Columbia. So long. <laughs>